or just on YouTube after the, the MCN channel? Uh, no, I've tweeted out a uh, playlist. So we've got about 14 videos now. So this will be added to the, the list of those. Yeah. But MCN has tweeted out the link as well. So you can take a look on the Twitter. Thank you all for joining us and welcome to Communication is Key, Strategies for Sharing Your Website Redesign with Stakeholders. Um, a website redesign is a massive undertaking in strategy, content, and design, and as they say, it takes a village. So we'll spend this hour discussing our methods for identifying stakeholders and partners and working with them through consistent, productive collaboration conversations. Redesigns present an opportunity to not only refresh things like fonts and colors and logos, but it's also a moment to confront how your organization works together. We're excited to discuss our successful and not so successful efforts in fostering these relationships to create user-friendly online experiences. So to start, I'd like to have our panelists introduce ourselves. Hi, I'm Pam Martin. I'm the Digital Content Manager at the Albert Knox Art Gallery in Buffalo. Um, just a little bit about us, we're a modern and contemporary art museum. We've been around since 1862. We have about 100 full-time staff, um, 125,000 visitors on site per year, and 315,000 online visitors a year. So we're not the biggest place, but we're also not the smallest. We consider ourselves kind of in the middle. Um, and that's important, you'll see later um, for connection. Um, I am in the publications office, and we manage basically everything that has words on it. I manage the website, emails, and co-manage 
social media. And we kicked off our latest redesign in the fall of 2015 and launched the website in November 2016, just two years ago. Um, and we worked with Blue Cadet out of Philadelphia and some other partners for um, some technology pieces, including our Search the Collection, which was a big part of the redesign. Hi, I'm Susan Lagotner. Um, Andrea and I are here co-representing the Field Museum. We're a 125-year-old science and natural history museum in Chicago. Um, you might know Sue, our T-Rex. Um, our website is managed by our web and digital engagement team. Our team manages um, basically everything not IT and not digital media for exhibitions, so web, social media, <coughs> um, we take on some other projects. Um, Andrea and I were the two primary staff members taking care of the day-to-day -day management of the website project, but we worked closely with our director, our content developer, and um, many, many stakeholders around the museum. Um, we started planning and doing some initial research for our project in the fall of 2016. Um, we were doing that work knowing we would need to support the museum's first rebrand in about 20 years, but we officially kicked off our redesign in summer, excuse me, summer 2017, and then we launched our site at the end of May this year, so we've been live for about six months. Um, we didn't have all the expertise we needed in-house, so we first pulled in a content strategist to do some upfront work. We contracted Sina Baram at Prime Access Consulting, um, and then our agency on this project was Purple Rock Scissors, who are in Orlando. Um, we really liked working with them a lot. We did our whole project with them from planning to design to development, and now we're still working on some post-launch phases, um, and we'd be happy to tell you what we like about them. My name is Ariana French. I'm at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, uh, where I'm director of digital. Uh, we have a small seven-person digital team, and we work largely with external partners uh, to complete most of our digital products and projects. Uh, for the relaunch of our website at amnh.org, we worked with a local agency called Ready Step Optic for the design, and a Vancouver agency for implementation called Mugo Web. We welcome around five million people to our museum every year, and online at amnh.org, we welcome about 9 million people every year. <coughs> we relaunched our website, or we are planning to relaunch our website in two phases. The first phase just completed on November 6th, and that's what I'll be focusing on later in my talk today. <coughs> and I'm Jen Schleidel. I'm the uh, interactive project manager at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, we are probably better known to some of you as the museum at the top of the Rocky Steps. Um, so our uh, website redesign has been largely managed in-house. Um, we have, a, it seems like a small team to us, it's about six, six full-time, uh, one part-time, um, but this is a transition from a long period of time at our museum where the web team was just two people. Um, so it's part of the transition of moving that kind of extremely siloed and things happening uh, kind of behind the scenes to a much bigger team um, who is communicating a lot more um, outwardly. Uh, is part of our um, project. We um, went, we, the museum underwent a, a rebranding a few years ago and our site got uh, just a, a front end reskin at that time to match the, the new visual branding. Um, but it, the uh, underlying CMS and, and all of the kind of un, under the hood stuff has not been touched in quite a while. Um, so that is also one of the major focuses of our, um, our first phase of redesign, uh, which my team is at home frantically trying to finish the build on. Um, where trying to launch our beta in just a couple of weeks, in early December, um, of not a full redesign of the site, but just of a couple of sections that we think are the most critical to um, our visitors, um, planning the visit, um, and also our calendar and what's on, um, which kind of displays um, upcoming events and exhibitions, um, and also um, kind of the day-to-day -day events, and those were the areas that we heard that visitors had the most trouble with, so we decided to focus on them first. Um, there, we have a, a, a whole slew of, um, independent contractors um, and, and other um, experts that we've hired in our project, and I'll show you a map of those later on. Um, but our team um, in-house is about six. Thank you all. So we've organized this hour according to the life cycle of a redesign. I'm gonna see here defining our approach, creating our team, getting down to business, going live, and then continuous improvement. For each phase, one panelist will present a case study diving deep into the communication methods they leveraged at this point in the project, um, and then we have some time for others on the panel to weigh in with alternative strategies, resources, and whatnot. And um, if we have time, we'll save an audience Q&A at the end. So without further ado, we'll get started. Defining your approach. We used a 
pretty traditional approach for our redesign at the Albright Knox, um, from discovery to definition to design development, QA and launch, basically one arc um, for the project. And we had sort of two parallel teams working on this, our core website team, who were really the decision makers. It was myself, um, my boss, our head of publications, our director of communications, our director of IT, and our uh, deputy director. And then we had a separate working group for our collection search, which I mentioned was a big component of the redesign. And we were meeting throughout the process to define functionality. Now, even though we worked with an external vendor for the redesign, Blue Cadet, we did much of the discovery and definition work in-house to save money. And this is where a lot of the internal communication um, happened. So during discovery, I led discovery meetings with staff members from nearly every department of the museum. As I mentioned, we're a sort of small staff or medium staff with 100 people. So I was able to meet with key stakeholders from almost every department. Um, I also knew it was important to talk to people outside the museum because we really wanted to focus the redesign on user experience. So I held some evening focus groups with visitors, members, students, people who had just moved to Buffalo um, to get their input. I also posted an online survey on our old website for visitors to fill out to see what they were looking for in uh, a new site. Um, and so I distilled all of the findings from those meetings into a creative brief that was approved by our internal team and then given to our vendor, Blue Cadet. Um, as I mentioned, our collection search team met regularly to define the functionality for that part of the project. And then there was obviously regular <coughs> communication between me and our Blue Cadet project manager on the other deliverables in this definition stage. Um, we did a lot of the work in-house, but then we were collaborating with them to sort of finalize the information architecture, wireframes, functional requirements to go into the design and development stages. Um, so while those two core teams I mentioned continue to communicate throughout design uh, and development. We didn't actually share much with our full staff or board or our you know, museum community along the way throughout the redesign um, because we just, we had those working groups and we felt like through the discovery phase we got what we needed to, to implement the project. But we did try to get staff volunteers and docents involved in other ways, including um, doing staged photo and video shoots to create new visual content for the new website. So we were getting people engaged in um, I really do think that having a smaller staff contributed to the fact that we're, we were able to do this with a lot of staff input along the way. Um, so the size of your staff and the feelings that staff members may have over ownership of content on your website may affect whether you're able to take an approach <coughs> like this or not. Um, we didn't have a lot of legacy content on our old site that people felt ownership over. Um, the blog that we had was a Tumblr blog and we managed all of that out of the publications office. We didn't really have um, curators or people outside our office contributing content. We would take curatorial content that was written for exhibitions and stuff and adapt it. So people weren't really worried about what was gonna happen to their content with the new site. We were able to be pretty flexible and nimble and um, you know, still work with staff members on the content from their areas, but we sort of took the lead and, and they would approve it and that seemed to work well for us. Again, it may not work for everyone, which is why we're gonna hear from some other people. Hi, so at the Field Museum, um, we have a lot of staff members who feel a lot of ownership over our website. Um, and so we were looking for ways to talk to staff and help them understand the approach that we were looking to take. So because we needed to time our redesign, um, to coincide or coincide shortly after a rebrand, um, we really had to phase our approach. We literally could not get everything done. The museum had done a redesign before where they tried to tackle everything at once and no one was really happy with the results at the end. Um, and since our staff is pretty scientific and research focused, um, I actually found that using data to show um, who was visiting our website really helped staff to understand the priorities we were setting. So, on the left, you're seeing our Google Analytics. You can see that about 61% of our users are looking at either exhibitions or visit planning information. Um, and then because I anticipated that people would ask me, well, the analytics don't tell you why, um, we also did a pop-up survey to directly ask users um, why they were visiting our website. And a slightly higher percentage of visitors told us that, of website visitors told us that was because they were planning a visit. 
So with these kind of paired data sets, we were able to really um, make the point internally that it was most important that we look at our visit planning, our events, um, how we talk about the museum and make that kind of our first phase and um, look later on at more niche audiences like educators, event planners, our scientific community as part of later phases. Um, so we took a very uh, similar approach in Philadelphia. Um, we um, retooled our Google Analytics accounts to give us some, uh, some better, clean, cleaner data on um, who was using the site and why. Um, we did a, a website intercept, um, I think almost two years ago. Um, so there was a lot of, we had some strong hunches going into the project of what our areas of focus were gonna be. Um, and even though we thought those were the right choices, uh, there were, we also have a lot of legacy content on our site. We're a large institution. We have between four and 500 um, staffers, um, many of whom feel ownership over various parts of the website. Um, so part of our um, education approach, um, and the web, this web redesign was the first time, or one of the first times at least, um, that the Philadelphia Museum has chosen an iterative approach and not just, um, you know, you, there's a start and there's an end and you hope that everything is perfect and finished by the end, which is, Again, when you're working with academics, that's generally the way that they prefer to roll. Um, so this, so we had some graphs and charts um, that we used um, to, to emphasize the fact that once we had finished this phase of work, that there were gonna be more following. Um, we prepared um, our stakeholders for many reveals of varying size and not one big perfect reveal, um, which is a point that we have to make pretty much every time um, we present or, or have a, a group conversation, because that's really, people don't hear it the first few times and it's really important. Um, and we also had a lot of um, kind of X, Y, you know, we need to do this to get to this, or, you know, it's not personal, our data told us this, and that's why we're doing it. So we've been approached that in, it's a matter of deciding who's gonna come along with you for this project, and you know, you have thoughts on this. I'd be, I'd be happy to just stay at the podium and click through and see if you guys do. Um, actually, I need to, I think I can see better from up there, so I'll just slow that down. Okay, so um, our first step um, in Philadelphia was to build, um, build out a stakeholder list and make a communications plan. Um, and we wrestled with how to build a stakeholder list. Um, we had many departments and I think the first stab uh, ended up being something like a 75 person <laughs> stakeholder list, which was <coughs> far too many people to be useful. Um, and finally, our department head um, had a plan, plan to, to reutilize people from existing museum committees who are tasked with working cross-departmentally and kind of thinking in a new way. And so we were able to, <coughs> to snag those people um, and arrange them into tiers um, and give them kind of different roles and responsibilities. Um, we had we gave many um, stakeholder interviews. Um, my tip to you would be give us give a voice to as many people as is feasible at the outset. I had um, something like 30 official interviews set up um, with about 60 people. I had a lot of people who just dropped in who didn't arrange. They weren't asked to be interviewed and they just kind of showed up with people. Um, and I was bent out of shape about that in the beginning, but the truth is, honestly, like if people are that, if they if they want to tell you their feelings about your website that badly that they're going to show up to somebody else's meeting to do it, just let them. Um, and that it really it it added a little bit of time in the beginning, but I think the the building the trust um, was worth it in the in the long run. Um, I heard somebody else um, mention this other tactic of um, you want to look at your interest level and influence. So like if your people are both interested and influential, you wanna make sure that they're on your team. Um, somebody else referred to this as keeping the terrorists at the table, um, and I think that that's been a good strategy for us as well. Um, and most of our decisions um, have been made by sort of mid-level, um, not senior staff um, who you know either may be very set in institutional ways or who have a lot of other things going on, um, but actually the staff that are inputting a lot of content on the site and who are running the programs or who are on the front lines. Um, and and the, the kind of the main point was you know, we wanted the visitor is supposed to be the, we are representing the voice of the visitor, it's not staff voices. So our general stakeholder group ended up being about 50 people. Um, there's a little bit in here about how we conducted those interviews. Um, basically, it was, a, it was an opportunity for them to, to vent to us partially, um, but also to tell us what they might know about their, um, their visitor constituencies and what they're using their site sections of the web for. Um, we recorded everything and um, uh, compiled all of those findings in Airtable. Um, which was a useful tool. We sort of joked at one point that Airtable should be the unofficial sponsor of this um, of this panel, so it's one we uh, recommend. Um, and then we invited everybody to a group workshop to kind of get some general ideas um, together early on. Um, the real decision makers at the PMA are, are our working group, um, which are essentially five super stakeholders um, who are one each who kind of represent these different areas um, of, of focus for the project and for the web um, in general. 
Um, a really key thing for us was to get kind of the buy-in from the director level to be able to do this. So instead of saying, you know, we have to hold off on reviews and approvals for, <clears throat> you know, our senior management team is about 15 people, um, all of whom are busy and who want to have opinions on lots of things, um, we were able to say, this is your working group or has been deputized by the senior management and by the director to, to do all of that work for you. Um, and so it was a smaller group of people and it was a group of people who was more um, in the center of, you know, between the worker bees and, and high level strategy, um, which was really effective for us. And we did different kinds of um, small workshops with them. Um, and senior management and executives and board, um, a necessary component of, you know, reviews and, and buy-in. Um, they, we agreed to um, update them on all of our um, uh, Status, status reports and, and projects, and we ended up giving them some tailored presentations. They are invited to other um, sessions, but they rarely attend, which we expected. Um, and just as a note of, uh, as a tip, we did not really build in enough time to do all of the high level um, initial buy-in on our approach, on the design, um, we had to go outside of the, of the museum and, and include pentagram on some of our early um, design phases, which took a really long time. So. Um, saved us some time to, to kind of leave those people at a review only level, but also build in time to, to let yourselves be able to do that. Um, so in the end, um, we ended up uh, working with a, a, a combination of contractors. Um, one of the things we didn't really do until it was, I don't want to say too late, but much later in the process than we should have, was plot out all the factors that we needed to work around. So all of those kind of like rocks in the middle that we knew weren't gonna move. Um, other projects, holidays, time off, maternity leave, uh, vacant staff positions. That is something that I recommend that you do early on. Um, and then we ended up looking at, um, we used a, a content strategist and a project manager early on that were helpful for us in kind of a long-term or a high-level strategy sense to get those projects off the ground. Um, and we ended up hiring two more of those folks that are um, focused more on tactical details um, and really kind of getting getting the content um, managed and getting the tickets in. Um, can I have my water? <laughs> I did not go to karaoke last night. <laughs> you would never know. Um, and don't um, don't forget about site maintenance and all of the other things. That was another um, kind of a constant workload that we knew about, but perhaps didn't take as seriously. So we ended up needing some part time help um, to finish all of that as well. Um, some of the benefits that we found uh, about hiring out. Um, and I've heard this from a couple other sessions too, sometimes just hearing it from an outside voice can help sell a new way of working or a new idea, even if it's one you've been talking about internally for a while. Um, if you need to sunset some old content on the site or some old ways of working, um, if those recommendations come from them, you can let them be a bad cop. Some of the cons though um, were that some of our contractors were super interested in building us like this perfect system and they weren't really ready to listen about all of the millions of exceptions that we have to workloads and content types um, until it was pretty late in the game. So if you do go that route, make sure that they understand um, the, the realities of working in your institution and not just building the best system. Um, we also are doing a lot in-house. Our design was done um, entirely by our in-house um, UX uh, senior designer. Um, it was a lot easier to, to work as an us and to present as an us um, when we are the, the face of the website and of the interactive team all the time. Um, but this also comes at a cost, time and bandwidth, uh, which are issues probably for everybody. Um, and in some cases, and mine in particular, uh, lack of experience with this, working with this kind of project. So that was a little bit of a slowdown as well. So here's how we ended up, um, sort of a map of all, all of the folks that it takes to, um, to run the site and to run the redesign. Um, our main players are kind of those dark bubbles in the center. Um, our on-site IIT staff, uh, front-end <coughs> dev, back-end dev, um, designer and UX. Um, then we also have a writer, editor, content strategist um, who is kind of shared among website projects and also in gallery, uh, um, say like in gallery uh, and general web updates. Um, we used a few um, off-site contractors um, to help with um, website accessibility um, guidelines and coherence. Uh, a few for Google Analytics, um, at least one for Elasticsearch, um, and those guys are all offsite and they communicate with the, our development team through Slack and email mostly. Um, our onsite contractors who are with us in the office at least a few days a week, um, we have a second project manager just to manage this redesign. Um, there's that tactical content strategist. Um, we also have um, had some temporary help running some user testing sessions. 
uh, and the back end up. Um, so they, I think this is maybe like a two week contract. Um, so there are, there are occasionally more, more hands on deck um, depending on what's going on. Um, and then all of that kind of the onsite project staff of those are the folks we communicate out to, but they're not directly involved um, in any way. And so this, I won't read every single slide, but um, <clears throat> I will recommend that you choose a set of tools early and stick to it. We wasted a lot of time replanning and replanning and replanning um, in different tools, all of which are great. Um, <clears throat> let's see what would work for you. And uh, for us, the redesign was a good opportunity to share what we do every day and not just on the web redesign. So increasing digital literacy in general and like what does the website do and what, what is the CMS um, has been an important part of our, <clears throat> our process. And to give an example of how other places have done it. I won't talk too much about this because I, I already mentioned the parallel teams, um, but we sort of work on these parallel teams and then I was sort of working on the Blue Cadet side of things for the overall design and development. And then our digital assets manager was working with Fiction, our digital asset management system on um, some of this collection search side. Um, if you take nothing else away from this, you might learn that having a map of your stakeholders and all the people working on your project is a really illustrative way to show the like ins and outs of your job and kind of how many people are involved in a project like this. So um, we saw a really like complex version from Jen. This is our version of the Field Museum um, with our digital team kind of at the center. We worked with a small like six person um, group that we called the user advocates. Um, so visitor services, um, our evaluation manager, exhibitions, um, IT, just a really close team who could keep us grounded and like help us really think through questions. And then we coordinated a lot with our steering team, which was pretty executive level. And then since we were working through a rebrand as well, we did a lot with um, the brand marketing graphics team. Um, so, and we did really share this map a surprising number of times. And I think it was helpful to just be able to remind staff that this is what's going on. These are all the people who are involved. Um, and we did find having that really useful. On the ground for the project, I feel like there are, there's a difference, right, between laying these communication lines down and making your chart, but actually executing on them. And I had uh, graduation with a launch last week. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we just uh, big lift. Um, so we're we're tackling the relaunch of EMH.org in two phases. The first phase, as Andrea just mentioned, just launched on the, on November sixth. And we're in the process of tackling our second phase, which is probably the more difficult one, which is a lot of the content issues that we've wrestled with for years, and the navigation issues that we want to revisit under the lens of a more data-driven approach. Um, but today, I just want to reflect a little bit back on phase one and the sort of look and feel redesign. So in terms of strategy of communications, we use a kind of blended approach in the sense that implementation and code was actually going, was being built in, in parallel with how we were communicating these changes to our stakeholders. Um, and these communications took form, took many different forms, um, and in many different forums, media, and at very different levels of seniority. This was a huge contrast to the previous redesign, which was way back in 2012, so we were way overdue, um, but it, that, launch in 2012 was actually the, the most successful launch after two failed attempts to relaunch the website. So there was a lot of research. <coughs> so the first track was getting the buy-in from our senior leadership, and this was absolutely essential at the outset. And it was essential for um, this green light for every track that followed with all of our other stakeholders. So that was 18 months before the relaunch um, in early November. And as we tried to give sort of ongoing progress updates to that group, we also started smaller meetings with individuals and groups and people that we knew would have concerns and uh, personally uh, invested questions uh, with regards to the website. We sought those people out. We had one-on-one -on -one, um, meetings with these different individuals, basically at different points in the implementation where we felt that it was a good time to sort of sit down with them and introduce them to the team. In conjunction with that, we also started some monthly meetings with our most active website uh, editors, and that was also a good opportunity to not only 
get introduced to some of the changes that were coming, but also try to uh, hammer home some of the best practices that we wanted people to try to pay attention to with respect to content. And then finally, at Closer to Launch, we started this idea of an open house, and all credit goes to the Philadelphia Museum of Art for the inspiration. Uh, this was sort of a weekly lunch and learn where anybody could drop in and learn more about the website changes that were coming and bring their lunch. And we also, the week of launch, uh, offered a week-long drop-in clinic. Um, so anyone, and in particular, our most active website editors could drop in with any questions that they had or concerns with respect to some of the new content modules that we were introducing. So the main challenge, no surprise, is what to show, when to show it, and who to show it to. Um, we were, as I mentioned, implementing things as we were sort of rolling out the uh, socialization of the site changes. Um, so it was a bit of an art and not a science to identify the implementation point <coughs> where it made sense to kind of peel back the curtain a little bit and um, give people some ideas about the changes coming to the site. And also we had to be really sensitive about the appropriate level of information for the stakeholder because we wanted to give them enough information that um, that it secured their buy-in and their approval, but not so much that it invited more questions and concerns. So I think all of you know what I'm talking about. Um, so, and also we had, uh, we have a very sort of democratized content production workflow at AMNH. Um, in other words, there's no centralized gatekeeper. So we have people in just about every department creating content every day. So we had to create a communication strategy that honored that existing system instead of trying to you know, impose a larger committee kind of organization with respect to socializing all of these updates. So these smaller formal meetings, instead of the big committee approach that we had previously used in 2012 and previous years, was a much better approach for us culturally. Um, and it also helped that we were building the site out in such a way that you could literally flip between the current, on a, like any given page, between the current site in its current design and the new site and its new design just by changing something in the URL. Um, between the team, and that was a small internal team of just about four folks inside m and plus our partners, um, Ready, Set, Rocket for Design and Nuco Web for um, implementation, we had nearly daily team communications and that was also key. So we did have stand-ups pretty much four days out of the week, but when we weren't in a stand-up, we were having you know conversations over Slack, email, and calls. Um, we didn't probably recognize or appreciate some of the challenges that our content itself would bring to the to the new design. Like I said, 2012 content and images is very different than 2018 content and images, and a large portion of our site hadn't been updated in three or four years. So to give you an example, this is the old site. Um, just this is just kind of a generic article page with some information about um, an expedition. And this is the same page in the new design. <laughs> and you can see the, the image looks kind of creepy and weird floating up there in space, um, but that's a reflection of you know, what was uh, in, the, in the old layout and what that, that supported versus now what we're trying to do to adjust for retina images and uh, a more streamlined design and, and layout of content. And with more on town halls, inspired by the Brooklyn Museum of Art. I talked to Sarah Devine there about um, communicating information about their Ask app, um, and she had made the suggestion that really opening up the process to people, um, but kind of putting the impetus on them to come and get information had been really helpful to them. Um, a big thing that took away from my conversation with her was making sure that um, you always took staff much of the way through your process to the point you were at, and then sharing new information. So every time we would open up the conversation to staff members, um, we would explain these are the goals we started out with, here's some of the strategy that we set, this is what we've already decided on, and okay, here's some new stuff for you. So we had planned to do three of these, probably like about quarterly over the course of our redesign. Um, we ended up doing two, and then right before launch, um, our museum had serendipitously scheduled an all-staff meeting, and so we were actually able to present to a broader audience that was a lot more captive than they might have been otherwise, so that worked out really well for us. Um, and then 
then just another sort of tip as part of this process, we found that being really um, strategic about our content planning and tracking made a huge difference in how we communicated and worked with others. So we also use and love Airtable, um, but being able to plan out our content so we knew that we would send subject matter experts, reviewers, con all the content they needed to review at once, and that we could see at a glance like where something was in the process, how many things were um, still in development, how many things were being reviewed, how many things were finished, um, made a really big difference for me in terms of communicating to people, and it meant that when we got really close to launch, I was able to say to our director, like, these are the five things that haven't been approved, like, can you help me get these people to just, like, let those things go. So um, I, I know that content development is a really hard part of a redesign process. We redid about 100 pages, but we have many thousands on our site. So um, tracking what's changing and what isn't um, is really helpful. Actually, Susan, if you want to stick around. <laughs> oh, so for being a switch, and like setting the date takes a lot of coordination, and there are a lot of decisions that have to be made. So we'll get into the weeds a little bit about what we did at the field. So you heard a little bit that we were working on a phased approach. We were communicating with many, many internal stakeholders. So we had known from the time we started the project that our relaunch wouldn't coincide with the launch of the museum's new brand. So we were really clear about communicating when we started that we thought our site would launch in late April or May. Um, the brand launch had been planned for January, got pushed back till March. We were trying really hard not to specify a particular website launch date for a very long time. Um, in mid-March, we really went out to staff and said, we need to do what we called a content freeze. We told them, um, we have a lot of publishers and authors in the museum who have been adding content. It was often really a burden on our team to be reviewing, keeping track of that content, dealing with requests from people. So trying to put that on hold as much as possible um, made a big difference for us in terms of getting a little time back for our team to work on this piece of the project since we were keeping our <coughs> site live. Um, we had some pushback on this, but um, it, I think was really worth it. We did accommodate some requests. Um, by mid-April, we were looking at how far we'd gotten with our agency and mutually decided that we didn't think we could launch on May 15th, which was the date that we um, had kind of been using internally. So um, we asked our agency for Borat Scissors to really think about what still needed to get done. We worked with them to make some tough decisions about features we would and wouldn't prioritize for launch. Um, and they came back to us and said, we think that we can launch the site around May 31st, so pushing it back just about two weeks. But we didn't want to do that endlessly, so we were really careful about setting what would and wouldn't be included for launch. And so once we set that date, that's really what we pushed towards. Um, and that's when we started communicating that. So we really didn't start communicating our launch date until about like four to six weeks before we were actually planning it. And we still tried to keep that like not super widely communicated. Um, so um, we pretty much told everyone we'd launch our site on the 31st, but we made plans to launch our site the evening of the 30th, which is a low traffic time for us. We wanted to make sure that our team and our development team could do the work we needed to do without um, like people sort of being like, is it live yet? Is it live yet? And so that made a big difference for us. Um, so as we were getting close to the launch, um, I mentioned that we were able to present at an all staff meeting. And so for us, having this opportunity to really present to as many of our staff as possible gave us this opportunity to highlight some of the things we had been doing and really share the why behind big changes. Um, so Brad Dunn, our director, and I gave a short presentation that again highlighted goals and strategy, not just mine. We referenced the number of staff who had been involved. We thanked content reviewers for their help in getting content live. Um, and we highlighted a few new features and things that we thought would kind of speak to staff um, in ways that reflected their work. So here you're seeing our um, discover more component. Our mission um, had this line about fueling a journey of discovery across time. Um, and so we have really designed this feature as a way to let us highlight scientific content that would get pulled around the site, um, which is sort of separate from that exhibitions, visit planning, all those priorities that we've been 
setting, but we thought that would help our um, scientific staff feel like their content was getting um, displayed around the site, getting highlighted. And we had also spent a lot of time, Andrea in particular, <laughs> coordinating and asking a lot of staff in terms of photography. Um, we really wanted to show what the experience of being at the museum was like as part of our site. And so we thank staff for that, and we really love some of these photos that show our staff at work um, with visitors. <coughs> so making our announcements. So we looked at all the information we wanted to make sure we would deliver to staff. Um, as well as to the public right after the announcement. So Caitlin Kearney, our content developer, and I worked together on a blog post for the public um, that shared how our website was changing. Um, we plan to feature that post on our homepage during the launch, and then we also did include it as a reference for staff members and other departments um, as sort of a public-facing way to talk about these are the sections that are changing, these are the things we're still hoping to do in the future. We also did an internal museum-wide email that we planned to go out the morning of uh, the morning after our launch, and we also attached a two-page memo with more information. This is a tactic I try a lot, and I'm still trying to figure out if it works, but kind of doing a summary email and then making sure that people who might be publishers and need a lot more information still have a place to get that, but not sort of forcing everyone to read a really long email. Um, so that included the basics about what had been updated, what hadn't, how to get in touch with us if you were noticing bugs or had feedback. Um, we had an existing website request system that we've been asking staff to use for the past, past few years, so we use that same system for continuity. Um, we were also really clear that only our team would be editing the site for the period after launch. We have had more than 100 publishers and authors, which is a whole nother um, puzzle at the field that we've been working on for the last several years, but we really needed to maintain the site for both brand and accessibility, and so we wanted extra time post-launch to work through how we would work with those people, and so we didn't want to immediately have others in the site making changes. Um, so we celebrated, so once we um, sent our site live, we did what digital employees do, and we posted to social media um, with the approval of our director. Um, we toasted, we got very lucky that when we walked out of the building that night, there was a double rainbow. Um, <laughs> so I hope you all get that lucky too. But um, as much as we were really excited to share, um, we were really lucky that um, our community really um, was able to congratulate us. Um, Sue, the T-Rex, tweeted it out the next day, nice. and then um, we did wait a couple of days to tweet it out over our field museum channels. We really just wanted to make sure we had time to work out the kinks. <coughs> um, I think it's also really important and sort of often forgotten to say thank you when you finish a big project. Um, so we wrote personalized thank you notes to our vendors, um, people who had worked really closely on the project. We sent t-shirts to our team of Purple Rock Scissors we were seeing there. Um, the next time the design and development team was in town, we um, had pizza with them and our user advocates group who had been really involved in the project. Um, and so really just wanting to make sure that we recognize people for their individual contributions, just saying like, hey team, we all did this. Um, we know that people have really different roles on the project. Um, and we spent maybe $500 to do this, so not a tiny amount of money, but compared to our overall website budget, very small. And of course, uh, live doesn't mean done. Uh, and it's been established at the start of this hour, everyone's sort of sitting at different distances from the launch date, but I thought it would still be helpful to end on a note of like, where they're sitting, what they're thinking about, and also, of course, how their communication strategies have changed now that the pace of the project has shifted. So at AM&H, uh, we used our backlog not so much as a parking lot for stuff that wasn't necessary for launch, but also as sort of like a deferred way to, to preserve and also categorize uh, needs after <coughs> launch. So, the, the mantra before launch was, do we need it for launch? If not, put it in the backlog. Um, or if it was potentially something we needed to address in a future sprint, then we you know, might have slid, it, slid the ticket down to a future sprint. But for the most part, um, we use the backlog as sort of an instructive way to help us categorize the, the next two or three sprints following launch, so it's been very helpful for that. And we've also been using, um, continue to use A-B testing and analytics insights 
um, to help us not only communicate some of these changes to our stakeholders, but also help us prioritize some of the decisions that you know we're making constantly every day, both before and after launch. So we call it um, almost affectionately the redesign that never ends. So we anticipate that a lot of those changes over the phase two of our work will be informed mainly by some of these analytics and A-B testing uh, programs that we're rolling out. Um, so at the field, we're about six months out from our initial launch in May, and so we had planned this phased approach, um, which basically became kind of section by section other parts of our site that were being updated. So um, we've been really strongly trying to communicate that our redesign isn't done, and we've been looking for any and all ways to sort of communicate to staff where we are in the process. So when we were working on our join and give section, which is basically where a lot of our fundraising content lives, we were making sure that we were just communicating that to our internal um, institutional advancement team. Um, we also started working with our agency to develop a sprint schedule. Um, and so we're working on two-week sprints that we really weren't able to keep to when we were just trying to get the site launched. Um, but we found that really setting um, priorities for those and working through them lets us know what's coming and then we're able to communicate what's coming to others. Um, and so since May, June, um, we have been working on some new features and so we've been trying to get better about sharing like release notes or changes that we've made. We can't share all the content changes, but um, we're looking for ways to communicate feature changes and bigger things to staff so they have a better understanding of the kind of work we do more generally. And so I recently did sort of a summary deck that's linked in the slide that Andrea will share out that highlights some of the things we've added since launch in an attempt to be a little bit more transparent around that. Um, we recently found out that we are losing a substantial amount of our um, outside web development budget for next year, so we are kind of back to the drawing board a little bit in how we look at some priorities. Um, so we're kind of thinking through how do we not just plan for next year, but communicate these changes um, based on what has happened to other staff. <coughs> two years, um, we're always adding content, fixing bugs, and adding enhancements as budget allows. Um, one thing to mention is we transitioned from our redesign vendor to a maintenance vendor um, about a month after launch. So you have to remember that maintenance vendor doesn't have all that institutional memory and history that the company who developed your website had. So there's a little bit of a learning curve almost every time we have like a big issue come up that I have to go back and sort of um, train them a little bit on, on what we did and why. Um, there's no cohesive process for internal changes, which has been a bit of a roadblock for us, so I would uh, recommend thinking of a way to make everyone sort of uh, funnel in to provide you what changes they need in, in some sort of tool to make it consistent. Um, and then it's always a challenge to sort of <laughs> set priorities for the changes you're gonna make or enhancements you're gonna make, and then you find a big bug and all your budget has to go to fix the bug. So then you've gotta communicate with the people who were hoping for those enhancements that actually I don't have the budget to do that right now. So it's sort of constantly setting and communicating those priorities. Thank you guys for sharing. Um, as Susan mentioned, I'll be sharing these slides out uh, after the presentation wraps, but just a few quick things. Here are a number of the resources we mentioned today, Airtable being one of them, as you said. Um, and we also have been compiling, and by we I mean Susan started, this amazing spreadsheet of uh, website redesigns that go as far back as 2014, I believe, and they're crowdsourced, and it's been a really helpful resource for us as we're looking at how sites, websites are redesigning and how they're talking about it. Um, it's editable, so if you see a site that has redesigned, please by all means add it. Um, and with that, Thank you, and we have about 15 minutes for questions before the coffee hour. Yes? Can you by any chance share any of the costs for the redesign projects that you had to? The question is about budgets and costs. I'd rather take that question offline if that's okay. Yeah. If you want to come up afterwards, I don't know if anyone else feels comfortable sharing. Our session is being recorded. Um, so I think we're all happy to talk about it, um, but maybe not for some. Yeah, I, I will say um, just one quick 
I will say one thing with respect to budget. We had to stretch ours over three fiscal years to get it done. Us too. Thank you. Uh, yep. Okay, for those of you who did state stakeholder interviews, how long did that process take you from like the first interview to the, to the analysis of the to the timeline of stakeholder interviews? Yeah. I'll just say quickly for us it was about a month to two months. because um, we did, we were, I probably did about like twenty small groups. Oh, okay. Yeah, it took us um, about three weeks to actually conduct the all of the interviews. Um, we were a little bit over um, we overcommitted in the beginning. We felt like, oh, we're just gonna book a conference room and do everybody gets an hour. They're really exhausting, especially when a lot of it is you know, it is partially event session for your staff, and so you're gonna hear a lot of stuff that may or may not have anything to do with you, but it's just like kind of a lot. So eventually we ended up changing our schedule to really, we didn't do any more than three of them in a day. So we either had a, a rough morning or a rough afternoon, but not both. Um, and that took us about you know, uh, three weeks to complete something like 30, 30 interviews altogether. Not counting um, air table inputting time. <laughs> that was all separate. So as I mentioned, we had to stretch our um, stuff over three fiscal years. So I think all told, probably around six to eight months. We stretched ours out too. We started with um, focus groups where we worked with Kate Livingston and did about 100 staff members and really um, big picture conversations that our team didn't sit in on. We knew there would be a lot of airing of grievances. Um, and then we did move into doing more targeted um, groups later on in the process. So we split them up over a, a year as well. so many collections databases that live outside our CMS, which was basically defined the scope of our phase one redesign. Um, so they didn't get uh, updated with respect to what we completed. Um, however, we're finding that the launch has actually created a lot of excitement and people are looking at their content for the first time in literally years. <laughs> so we're trying to seize this opportunity and this momentum to try to get some of these outliers on board uh, with our CMS and a more updated content strategy. Actually, my question is for secretary to the field. Um, so Susan mentioned we took inventory of our microsites, and I think a number of us have worked with outside vendors and with our content, or our copywriter, and uh, specifically giving her access to the microsites and like letting her know that this is the main website, this is the voice and tone, and this is the content that would be helpful as you're drafting it, was super helpful for her as she was trying to um, establish some drafts for us. We had a Tumblr blog that was separate from our site, our old site, and we decided we wanted the blog to live within our, our new site. So we prioritized what posts from the Tumblr blog we wanted to input into the blog <coughs> the new website. We didn't do everything. We're actually still going back to the Tumblr blog and bringing stuff over if it's timely, related to something we're doing now, but. Curious on how each um, institution defined parameters and reinforced parameters, like the scope of work. So, for example, continuously communicating that microsites were part of this rollout. <coughs> for Ariana, I'm really curious the way that you phased with the kind of look and feel first and then the content should be second. That's not a very easy one for people to separate and say, like, 
we're not going to discuss that or we will like put that in the back burner. Mm -hmm. So defining a lean person is scope of work. Yeah. So from a functional or technical standpoint, our existing CMS platform, which is our enterprise CMS for <coughs> most of the museum, was sort of the scope of, of change you know, for this phase one. Um, and as I sort of alluded to earlier, in terms of keeping that reined in, keeping all of those requests, all of those, um, you know, what about this microsite? What about this change? What, you know, can you change this out or whatever? All of those requests were weighed against or seen through the lens of, um, do we need it for launch? Um, what do our analytics tell us about what you are asking us to do? And using both of those to sort of help prioritize or defer, or in some cases not address whatsoever, um, some of those scope requests and scope changes. I also just literally communicated the scope at every possible opportunity. I think you can't ever assume that someone has been in a conversation before, remembers what was said in a conversation before, and so just making sure that you keep people reminded of what your scope is, um, and when they ask particular questions, um, kind of politely directing them like, yes, that's a part of this, or no, it isn't. Um, I don't know that it always like saved us, but at least we really, really made an effort to make it clear to people what we were doing and what weren't. we weren't. And I think that we didn't get as many questions after launch about like, what about this as we were getting prior to launch um, as part of that. Also, I will echo repetition at every opportunity. Um, we had a SharePoint um, internal intranet page um, where our five you know, bullet points for this is, you know, winter, you know, 20, 2018, this is what we're focusing on. Um, we also used our website, monthly website Wednesdays to kind of explain what those items were. Um, so like one of our bullet points is we need to make a whole new CMS, but like lots of people don't even know what CMS stands for, much less how it functions. So that was one of our kind of presentations to the larger staff was why, like what is, what is this? How does it affect you? Why is it gonna take us a long time to do? Um, we had one major change to our scope. We ended up um, adding content strategy to it, but that wasn't part of that was something that we missed initially. Um, and so that was another presentation at a website Wednesday was, you know, here's, you're gonna see a new bullet point um, on the scope list and this is what it means. Um, and it was a big oops for us <laughs> to kind of have forgotten about it. Um, and that was a big addition for us. But yeah, repeat and explain. Um, I think it tends to stick more when people actually understand, you know, yeah, what, what the CMS is, what does content strategy do for your institution, um, what's going on behind the scenes that they won't see. You know, for us, the homepage redesign is like, that's the big you know, thing that people are kind of grabbing onto because we're an art museum and people are very visual. Um, but we had a lot of behind the scenes work, um, you know, both from the realm of servers and um, CMS and you know, kind of accessibility checks and balances that um, so we made sure to explain what people weren't seeing as well as what they were. Uh, I'm curious if as part of any of these projects that you looked at some of the third party systems that you might have used for your websites, like your ticketing or e-commerce, things like that, uh, and whether that was considered to be in scope as part of the project, and if it wasn't in scope, how you went about sort of dealing with those integrations with some of these maybe legacy systems that you would have for the scope function. Looking at third party integration in that scope. Yeah. So we got a new ticketing and CRM system uh, sort of in the middle of our redesign process. Um, Blackboard all true. And I think luckily for us, we were just linking out to all true pages. So we didn't have to integrate any all true functionality into the skin of our site. Um, we're just linking out to an event registration page, a ticketing page, a donation form, a membership sign up form. So that was fairly easy to integrate into the process. Um, we're also linking to our internal collections management system, Menzi, and our digital asset management to power the collection search. That was an extremely complicated process. We knew it was gonna be complicated, but it was like 10 times more complicated than we <laughs> even anticipated. <laughs> if anyone wants to talk more about collection search afterwards, please find me. Um, and then our online store. <laughs> we, we were planning to do a, well, we had been working on for a long time, a Shopify site, and that actually got nixed at the last minute. And so we had to launch our new website with no online store. Um, and that was only launched this past summer, like a month and a half after the website launched. So that was a bummer. Uh, we also had 
have a separate ticketing and CRM platform that um, because it wasn't in scope, you know, for phase one of the relaunch of AMNH.org, it got which is backlog, um, but I'm happy to see, oh, and it's also a different set of uh, partners with the museum that actually manage that site. Um, so we had to sort of work with their timeline and what their pipeline was capable of delivering and when. Um, so hopefully they'll update it soon to better match the look and feel of the main website, but we're sort of, you know, hoping and waiting, um, you know, and, and hoping that it'll happen soon. Um, and all indications say that it will but that's basically been the story for every one of our uh, third-party sites, including our <coughs> online shop site. Um, the extent of the changes that we propose at this point in time, anyway, is just putting up a new header and a new footer, for example. Um, we, like the Albright Max and AMNH, um, have external ticketing and shop sites. We heard a lot of feedback on both of those sites as we were talking to people, and so figuring out how to share some of that feedback with um, the right internal teams was a part of a challenge for us. We weren't sure if we would be changing our ticketing platform um, as kind of a phase two piece of things. Um, one of the things that I tried to keep in mind throughout our process was knowing that our institution sometimes makes um, changes or we were dealing with some ticket um, package prototyping while we were in the midst of this process. So we really looked for solutions with our vendor that would let us make updates to packages and the way we communicate them and how we point people around the site, knowing that our current situation might not be our forever situation, um, but it seeming like it will likely be our situation for at least um, the foreseeable future. Yeah, we have also <coughs> external store, um, external ticketing. Um, our press room is a, is a separate add-on, um, and we have a section of the site for the capital campaign that's uh, technically a, a separate behind the scenes thing. We just made sure that all of the folks who are um, hooked into those um, vendors and who are making those updates are part of our stakeholder team. So um, the, the people who are involved in ticketing and programs are you know, generally always at the meetings and the person who's the, the head of development you know, in the area that manages the campaign site is there. Um, we didn't end up needing to make any major changes other than just sort of you know, where, the, where the button's pointed to, um, but it was just we made sure to have all those folks in the, in the, the, the shortest communication loop um, in case they're you know, planning something that was gonna affect us and vice versa. So just keeping, keeping everyone close. <laughs> One more question. Um, somebody mentioned working with a content strategist. Can you just say what kind of like work product you would give a team just to like deliver the deliverables of a content strategist? Um, so we had our, our first content strategist um, delivered to us an, an interim content strategy. Um, to, it's content strategy is something that our museum is kind of coming around to um, in a lot of ways, and there wasn't an existing. Uh, it wasn't an existing one, and, and so her deliverable to us was a um, kind of a brief brief document that outlines, um, so for us it was sort of the, the base of visitorship is 70% of what we're gonna focus on, 20% um, um, learners um, and 10% influencers. And so that, not that, you know, that basically if you wanna be an influencer or, you know, be involved in learning activities, you were gonna need to be a visitor first. And so that was kind of, her, her deliverable helped us to push this idea of, of the visitor-focused redesign. Um, and so for us, it was a, a document, and we also, um, she came in for a workshop session with our um, executive leadership and some of the other folks that are, for whom content strategy is gonna become more of a question in the next couple months or a couple of years. Um, and our um, sort of more tactical strategist is actually doing, it's kind of the, um, the hands-on work of going through pieces of content from the site um, and identifying those, um, what needs to change, what's not the right tone of voice, um, where um, images might need to be swapped out, and so she's working with our um, our full-time uh, writer and editor to kind of map out all of those places that um, that need to be swapped and switched and and frozen where they are, um, and so that's what that's her 